So I think we get started. Um, we are expecting a few more people, but um, they'll be joining as they come. So uh, we're super excited to have everyone here today for a very special event, NFTs WTF. It'll be a conversation with Brian Morris about what NFTs are. There's been a lot of interest around this topic over the past couple of months. So we're finally happy oh, to have her. Hold on, hold on. Okay, someone was off mute. And we're really happy to finally be creating the space for, for this conversation about something that's been on many people's minds. So before we get started, just a quick introduction for those of you that may not know who we are. And then I, and then I, I just ask if there's any, all right, thank you. Yeah, if you're able to mute yourself, there is gonna be a chance to unmute yourself later on. So we ask that you stay muted, um, at least for now. But like I was saying, for those of you that are unaware, we're the Chicago Graphic Design Club. We've been around since May of 2020. And what started off as a community focused on just designing graphic, discussing graphic design books evolved into what you're seeing today, um, conversations and talks with design leaders, not just across Chicago and beyond. So we're super excited. Um, if anyone doesn't know much about us, you can visit our website or you could follow us on Instagram where you could find any upcoming events. And as always, there is an opportunity to get involved. So if anyone has any interest around like just helping build an inclusive design community, our door is always open. So you can shoot us a message on the email that's on the screen, or you could send us a direct message on Instagram. We're always looking for ideas. We're always looking for people that wanna get involved. So. If you feel like that person is you, um, we'd love to hear from you. And then in addition to that, we do have a, when we're not doing these sort of events, we do have a running community on Slack that is pretty much a space where designers get together to talk about all sorts of things from um, career to design feedback to just general introductions. Um, it's free to join. And if you want to join that Slack community, you could go to our website. There is a banner on our homepage that says get involved. And, um, and from there, you should be able to, to join our Slack. And then as far as things coming up, um, these are some lovely posters that Jamie did. Um, so we, because we did start off as a book club, we are having a upcoming book discussion next week. Uh, we'll be discussing the book Baseline Shift untold stories of women in graphic design history. Um, you, that's gonna be March 10th. If you wanna register for that, um, you could go to our website. There's a link to register for that. And then also later this month, March 17th, we're inviting the design studio Barnbrook Design and they're gonna be discussing their new audio visual project, Fragile Self. Um, Barnbrook Design is a pretty awesome design studio They've done work for David Bowie in the past. And yeah, it's, it's they're going to be our first overseas guests. So again, you could register for that on our website. And um, before we move on, uh, just a quick introduction about Brian. So Brian has been a good friend of mine for around, you know, five years. And if you're not aware of who he is, he has 20 plus years of experience in digital design. Um, and now he is committing his just his job 100% to being an artist. So if you want to see more of his work, you could visit his website, honestlittledrawings.com, or you could follow him on Instagram, where he posts pretty much amazing stuff all day long. So um, that's my introduction. Um, I will let you give a more elaborate introduction, Brian. Uh, <laughs> I will stop sharing my screen, and I'll pass the floor over to you. And, and then just one last thing, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat. There is going to be some time at the end for a Q&A. So um, drop your questions and then at the end, either I could read them or you could unmute yourself and you could read the, ask them yourself. But with that said, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it over to you, Brian. Thanks, Christian. Um, I really appreciate that. And it's, it's truly an honor to be here tonight. Um, I remember the first uh, book club meeting you did uh, when we were working together. I was sitting in that first meeting right next to you. So it's really cool to be 
here tonight in front of a more people, a broader audience, and seeing you do, you and the club do bigger and bigger things uh, year after year. So thanks, brother. It's good to see you. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I do uh, want to tell you just a little bit more about myself so you have an understanding of the perspective from which I'm coming from. Um, because there are many ways to think about NFTs, um, and there are many people entering the space from different trajectories. Like even tonight, when I look at the attendees on this list, just the people I know, uh, everybody from college students to financial planners to people that have been in cybersecurity for 25 plus years. So there are a lot, there's a lot of different people coming into this space. They all have different points of view and different perspectives. Um, I just want to make sure you guys understand from where I'm coming from. Because you're going to hear different things about NFTs. You'll, you'll hear um, a million different uh, sides to, to any one of these topics. So this is my best understanding after a year of full immersion in the space. Um, so like Christian said, I've spent about the last 20 years in the design field. I started as a illustrator for a stock art company, like making drawings for phone books, like literally was my job. Um, and then worked my way up to become a chief creative officer at a national agency uh, held by WPP. And then most recently um, spent a lot of time with Christian um, at a big four consulting firm as a group creative director and co-lead of the experience design uh, capability. And so I kind of have a, uh, I understand the digital space really well, uh, but I've always had that artistic bend. Uh, and then November, well, I took a little leave from working and for the last year, basically, my whole whole existence has revolved around NFTs. I minted my first NFT uh, a year ago last week. Um, so I just had my mintiversary, which I'm very excited about. So what I'm going to share with you tonight is very much a perspective from a creator's standpoint. I'll talk about some things from a collector's standpoint. I'm probably going to avoid some of the more technical stuff because I don't think this is the forum for it. And we're just not going to be able to cover very deeply into that, get very deep into that in the time that we have. Right. Um, so my hope tonight is that you guys actually walk away from this conversation with more questions than you showed up with. Um, I hope to give you a little bit of information across a couple of the, the key kind of uh, arenas inside NFTs. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at some uh, how to mint an NFT. We're gonna look at uh, a wallet. We're gonna look at all kinds of great stuff. So it's gonna be kind of action packed. I have to say, though, before I go any deeper, um, take everything I say tonight uh, uh, with a gigantic grain of salt. Um, nothing I say is financial advice. I am not a financial uh, wizard. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. Do not bet your eggs on the things that I tell you because I will probably be wrong and it's all gonna change by the time it comes out of my mouth. So um, never risk anything that you're not worth, uh, you're not uh, uh, you know, capable of letting go of. So you know, don't go too hardcore into this um, if you're not able to and, and just, uh, all, all I'm saying here is don't follow everything I say to the, to the letter because there's different ways to do this stuff. And I don't want to be responsible for you coming to me in a year going, I lost my house because I bought a JPEG of a monkey. Um, the other thing is do your own research. Um, you'll hear this a lot in the NFT space. Um, there are a lot of people out there uh, slinging a lot of stuff that is not true or misleading. And they do so because there's a lot of folks that don't know anything about NFTs and they don't know any goddamn better. And this person said it with confidence and he's on Twitter, so it must be true. Don't listen to any of that stuff. Um, you gotta do your own research. The NFT space is truly the wild west. You are your own bank. Um, when something goes wrong, there's nobody there to help you. So make sure you understand what you're doing um, or at least have a basic sense of how it all works and that you're kind of tiptoeing into things. Do your own research. Don't be afraid to fail because you will a couple of times. Also tonight is not an environmental conversation. I know it's a hot topic. Everybody likes to talk about it. We won't solve it here on the call. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is never, ever, ever give your wallet seed phrase out. Even if you don't know what a wallet is right now, you don't know what a seed phrase is right now, it doesn't matter. At least you know never to give that information out, okay? I wanna make sure everybody, if you forget everything else I say, 
Remember that. Never give your seed phrase up. Okay. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about what the fucking NFT actually is. I have a good practical example um, that helps demonstrate that. We'll talk about some of the different types of NFTs, different categories of them. We're going to talk about a couple of the chains. There's a bunch of different blockchains. There's a couple that are more uh, pervasive in the NFT space. We'll talk about those at a high level. Um, we'll talk about uh, you know the, how an NFT lives in a wallet, so how a wallet writes to a contract, all that stuff. We're going to mint a couple of things. We're going to mint something as if I was going to go mint uh, a new piece from an exciting collection that I want to collect. Um, so I'll show you what that looks. So I'm going to mint through a website. And then uh, we're going to mint a new piece as a creator. So I'm going to mint a piece that I'm going to give out to 10 people that are collectors of mine. I'll walk you through that process too, and you'll actually get to see it happen. Um, and then just a few words on how to de-risk yourself in this space. It's all pretty simple stuff, but I want to make sure to touch on that as well. And then um, some handy dandy links that will kind of help you start looking around. Like, what are some of the wallets I should look at? What are some of the marketplaces? How do I look at transactions? Um, I'll give you a few links. And then I hope there's some time to get through some questions. Um, I'll try to speed up my tempo a little bit to make sure we have that that room at the end. Um, and I hope we have a little bit of fun along the way. If I'm going too fast, uh, tell me to slow down. And like Christian said, if a question comes up, bang it in the chat over there, and then um, we'll, we'll kind of comb through those when we get some time at the end. Okay, so far so great. Let's fucking go. Okay, what is a non-fungible token um, is the first thing you should probably know. Um, so I have a little demonstration and Christian's going to give me a, a hand here. I did not come up with this demonstration. Um, I saw it on the internet. I like it. It is a demonstration that Serena Williams, the tennis player, uh, her coach gave this demonstration when she came out and started slinging NFTs and her fans didn't know what the hell they were. Um, and it's a great one. So Christian, can you help me with a little demonstration? Yeah, of course. Great. Okay. Um, if everybody can see me, I have in my hand two tennis balls. Run of the mill, just bought them, just opened them up. Um, they're exactly the same in every way. Christian, choose one of these balls, right or left. Don't tell me. Keep it in your head. I'm going to put these balls back behind my swizzle them around. Okay. Christian, which one of these is yours? The one that's in your left hand. Maybe. I don't know. Um, and nobody else would either because they're all the same. Um, there's no nothing really defining about them. Uh, this one's the same as this one is the same of, you know, anyone you'd go buy in the store. Um, if somebody told you go grab three balls, you're not going to get picky. You're just going to grab one of the three, right? In that way, we would say that they're fungible. They're exchangeable for one another. They have the same intrinsic value. There's nothing defining about them between one another. You you don't own one, you know, in particular. One's not been assigned to you, if you will. So like these are, they're fungible. You can exchange them for another. Um, now, if we were to write your name or just put a, put an X on one of them, you can see that at home. When we did that same experiment, Christian, which one of these two balls do you choose the one with an X or one without an X? Say one, one with an X. X. Great. The X. Okay. Pull them around. Pull out. Which one of these two balls is yours? The X. All right. So these are, this ball is no longer fungible. This one, these two still are. These are interchangeable, but this one has been assigned ownership and it's unique and it's got a marker on it. Um, that makes it not fungible with the other, it's non fungible with the other balls. So, like this one's special. We know who owns it. If I threw this across the field and there were 40 other balls, eventually you'd find the one that's yours and say, ah, oh, this is it. That's a really simple explanation. This ball represents a digital asset. So in a sea of digital assets out there, all over the damn place, this one is yours. It's like the simplest explanation I can think of to kind of explain what a non-fungible token is. Um, those tokens can exist in a bunch of different ways, perform a bunch of different utilities. The, the one that most people are familiar with and see on the news or on the internet or 
spend a lot of money on tend to be the, the ones at the top two here. Collectibles and PFPs. PFP stands for profile picture. Um, so collectibles and PFPs, those are the bored apes of the world, the cool cats, the crypto punks, the, the stuff you see on the news, right? Like, you know, Jimmy Fallon or whoever the hell buys one and whips it out and everybody goes, oh, he paid a lot of money for a monkey. Um, collectibles are exactly that. They're, they're kind of designed to have some rarity around them, typically. Um, they're usually in large collections of 10,000 or less. If you think about 10,000, isn't really a lot, but in this space it is. Um, oftentimes they're very similar to one another, like in the case of apes, um, you know, it's kind of a base ape and you change the hat and the sunglasses and the color and the eyes, and there's rarity assigned to all those different traits. And depending on which one you have, it's worth more or less. Um, people use them as profile pictures. That's one of the primary utilities, um, but that's not their only utility. And there's thousands of these things, um, floating around thousands of different collections. These are the things that are super hot in the NFT space right now. Um, we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Fine art is another big one. Um, this is typically a traditional artist that, or digital artists that aren't really worried about making collectible monkeys. They have art that speaks. They tell stories through it. Um, it's their craft. Oh, Sydney, we can hear you. No. Um, these are folks, you, you may not know these names, but they're really big in the NFT space. Folks like Gabe Weiss, Sabat, uh, Pop Wonder, Mumbot. Um, I put myself in this category, though I'm not in the same league as those guys. Um, this is, we make amazing digital pieces and we offer them to, for sale as an NFT. Um, sometimes it's an artist, other times there's things like on-chain art, which is basically art generated by code. Um, there is no asset other than the code itself and it renders in real time. Um, so there's a lot of nuance inside fine art as well. Other asset classes are things like metaverse land. So you can buy land in sandbox or any of these other metaverses and you, you own that thing. Like it, it's like if you owned a plot in Minecraft, um, you know, it's a different paradigm to land ownership. Um, and it's not just the land. It's also, you know, the house, the cars, the, the abilities you have, all those things can be NFTs as well. Um, music, um, another big one, one that's growing in prominence, um, Death Row Records. I don't know if you guys all saw, but Snoop Dogg owns Death Row now. And he is turning it into not just a record label, but an NFT label. Um, in fact, I think it was yesterday, or the day before, he dropped a track where if you buy that track as an NFT, um, you not only own it, but you, I believe, can remix it and all that other great stuff. So you're essentially getting access to his stems through an NFT. Pretty incredible. Um, access to things. So uh, above and beyond it being a picture or a music track, holding an NFT in your wallet could give you permission to enter into events, spaces, opportunities that those that do not have it cannot. So it becomes not just a, 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 a badge to wave around. It is your ticket into the events and such. Um, gaming is also, it's growing tremendously. The thing I probably know the least about are gaming NFTs because it's changing so rapidly. Um, one game that's really popular, uh, Axie Affinity. This is essentially a play, pay to play to earn um, system where you buy a character, you play that character, you own a token, you earn tokens in the process. You can convert those to money. Um, so you're literally, it's literally your job to play this game. Um, there are so many new things that are coming out with uh, gaming NFTs. Um, some of the really exciting stuff are actual playable NFTs. So you can play the game right in your browser, or right through your phone. Um, and you can invite people into it. You can create new levels. Like it's, it's, you become a game developer sometimes in that way. It's really incredible. A lot of these NFT projects though, aren't any one of these things, but a combination of them. So you might have a collectible NFT of like an ape per se, um, that if you hold that ape, then you get airdropped uh, art pieces by uh, artists. That is to say, um, the, the ape community will commission art and have it dropped to people that hold the apes. Um, access you get access to things that other people don't so the board ape yacht club just partnered with adidas and 
you can get official merch and all that great stuff uh, because of that. Um, the apes are, they've rolled out a game already. Um, they've got presence in many metaverses. So like simply holding that ape, not only do you have the, the badge prestige of it, but now you have access to all this other acti- all these other activities and goods that other people don't. Um, so that's a, it's a way for people to add utility to these JPEGs. There are so many other classes as well. Uh, these tend to be the, the bigger ones that people spend their ETH on. Uh, speaking of spending ETH and how it all kind of fits together. Um, so regardless of the NFT type, whether it's a game NFT or, or a picture of a monkey, um, it's held. It's held in a wallet. A wallet is kind of, it's your, it's your vault of sorts. It is, it's your wallet. Um, when you own it, it exists in your wallet um, until such time as it doesn't. Um, whether you sell it, trade it, transfer it, burn it. Uh, burning means you basically send it to a, a wallet address that is unretrievable. Um, so the thing still exists, but nobody can ever touch it again. Um, hence, it's kind of non, it, it exists, but it's, it's burned. Nobody can ever use it. Um, so if NFTs live in wallets, the blockchain, um, whichever one you're, you're talking about, essentially keeps track of what is in everybody's wallet? Where did it go? Uh, who moved it? When they move it? How much did they pay for it? How much did it cost to move it? Um, those blockchains are really the thing that control when Christian put an X on this ball. Um, the blockchain is what keeps track of what X is on what balls, if you will. Um, that's a very simple explanation of it. But essentially, blockchains are, are ledgers. Um, they work just like cryptocurrency in that way. Um, to move things across the blockchain, move ownership, you transact, uh, your wallet basically transacts with contracts. So every action that you take on the blockchain is an action, is an interaction with a contract. And your wallet is essentially what um, identifies you as you. You make the interaction, that contract pulls money or crypto out of your wallet gives it to the person you're buying the thing from, and it takes what they're selling you and puts it into your wallet. It facilitates all that. Again, very simple explanation, but uh, there's a lot of different nuances to that. But in essence, that's how it works. So NFTs are held in wallets. Blockchain are the ledgers that keep track of what NFTs are in whose wallet. And then your wallet interacts across all that stuff to to perform those transactions and um, identify you as you. That's the other thing in, in Web3, so kind of a different side conversation. In Web3, your wallet is essentially your identifier. You don't have a bunch of usernames and passwords. You connect your wallet to a Web3 experience, and that's your identifier. Everything in your wallet is, in theory, viewable to the, the sites that you connect to. So you can use those assets in, in different ways, depending on the sites you go to. But anyway, I digress. Does that make sense so far? NFTs and wallets, blockchain keeps track of what's in everybody's wallet, and then you interact with contracts to move things around. Yeah. Um, those contracts, um, well, I'll get back to that in a minute when we talk about some of the things to de- de-risk yourself, but those contracts are, when you sign those things, that's it. It's happening. Um, you can't claw it back um, unless the transaction's stuck, but you really can't claw it back, so you're committing uh, when you when you when you sign off on something important point there are many different blockchains um, hundreds uh, new ones pop out every day um, there are three that are used a lot with nfts um, i would say these are kind of the big three people will probably meet me outside my garage here and say you're not talking about you know cardano you're not talking about wax where's flow i love flow um those are great and they're important and they're useful. Um, these are the three that people typically uh, create work for and collect work on. Uh, Ethereum, Polygon, and Tezos. Ethereum is kind of the big one. It's the one that um, a lot of uh, collectors prefer. A lot of creators prefer it because a lot of collectors prefer it. We won't go into all the nuances as to why that is. Um, Polygon is... Uh, Another one that's very, very popular 
It is uh, like a layer two solution to ETH. Um, so it shares some of the same um, marketplaces and wallets. And then Tezos is its uh, really its own its own little beast. Um, it's really great to it's it's a more economical um, blockchain, and it's a great place to learn the space. Um, if you wanted to to dive into NFTs in a fairly low risk low financial risk way, Tezos is not a bad place to start. Uh, Polygon would be a, a, a close number two, and then ETH is. ETH is kind of—I wouldn't say it's like playing with a loaded gun, but you're you're going to be playing with some some money um, here and there, and uh, it's easy to make mistakes. So it might be worth playing around with Matic and uh, or Polygon and Tezos at first. But anyway, um, Ethereum's the big one. Um, it's used for primarily most NFTs are on it. Um, the, the wallets that are used for it. Uh, MetaMask is the most popular uh, by a large margin. There are others. There are many others. Um, there are different types of wallet, but when it comes to a hot wallet, MetaMask is is the one that most people use, and it's most widely accepted by Web3 sites. Um, the marketplaces, uh, here again, for both Ethereum and, and Polygon, OpenSea is the biggest marketplace simply because that marketplace is an aggregator for um, all things of certain contract types. Um, so think of it as like, uh, I mean, is yeah, it's a giant aggregator. If it's an NFT uh, that's of a, a couple different contract types, then it's it's on OpenSea. You don't even have to put it up there. It just pulls them in. Um, so it's, it's really widely used uh, for collecting and for minting new work to put out into the world. Um, but because it's the biggest, it's very difficult to find things on. Uh, it's very different to get your work noticed on. It's very easy to succumb to uh, what we call copy minters or scams. Um, it is rife with it. Um, on the average week, I report between 20 to 30 fake collections of my work. That's people have taken my work, minted it as their own, put my name on it, but it's not my account, um, and trying to sell it as mine. Um, that happens to so many artists. I'm not trying to make like Brian's a big deal. It happens to so many artists. It's fucking infuriating. It's really bad. Um, but be that as it may, it's the most popular place. For in terms of fees and impact, uh, ETH is pretty high. Um, to mint something, it can range anywhere from 20 bucks to several hundred. Um, sometimes the gas fees. Uh, can go up into the thousands. Um, uh, when we say gas fees, like a transaction fee, can sometimes be thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I've seen screenshots of it as high as $60,000, which is just insane. Um, the environmental impact with Ethereum is pretty high because of the energy consumption. Um, well, of the three here, it's by far the highest. So if you are a uh, you know environmentally conscious person, Ethereum's probably not your chain to be playing with. Uh, conversely, uh, if we look at Polygon, Polygon has a lot of the same advantages of ETH in terms of the wallet used, MetaMask, again, being really uh, widely accepted, um, OpenSea being the primary marketplace for Polygon projects. Um, but the fees and environmental impact is much, much lower, um, cents, as compared to, you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, it's less preferred by collectors, um, mostly for, I would say, prestige reasons, um, but it's a good place to learn and a good place to get familiar with a wallet and a good place to get familiar with OpenSea uh, at a lower price point and, and kind of risk tolerance. And then Tezos um, is really its own chain, man. Um, it's, uh, I don't even know how, it's got a whole culture around it. Um, it's pretty rad. Uh, one of the big wallets for them is uh, the Kukai wallet. Um, uh, big markets for that, uh, Hikiknunk. Hikiknunk recently was, the official one was shut down, but some clones have popped up. Um, uh, Tezos, like I said, it's a weird space, man. You should guys go do some research on it um, and, and learn a little bit about it. It's had a really wild ride this year. And the, essentially the guy that developed the marketplace decided he didn't want to do it anymore and shut the whole thing down, leaving 
thousands of artists and collectors like reeling as to like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? Um, the community stepped up and basically rebuilt these marketplaces and came up with some new ones. And it actually made the community tighter. Um, in terms of fees and impact, super low, really inexpensive um, transaction fees. The work that you collect is just as good as what you'd find on Ethereum. Um, in fact, a lot of artists that mint there also mint on Tezos. But instead of $500, $500 for a piece of artwork, you might pay five. Um, it's a it's a really fun spot to, to collect a lot of great work for very little money. Um, those are kind of the three big ones. I know I kind of jumped around there, but go do a little investigating on Ethereum. Learn a little bit about Polygon. Learn a little bit about Tezos. Again, do your own research. Just type these things into YouTube or, or, or Google and, and read a few different opinions of them. Watch some videos of people minting things and buying things on these chains. They're out there. People creating tons of content around it. Uh, watch a lot of it because you're going to hear different things in each one and you'll be able to pull out what's bullshit and what's not after a, an afternoon of it. You'll, you'll get a better sense. Way too much stuff to try to cover in an hour here. Okay. I just said a lot, but let's see how it all kind of fits together. We're actually going to mint a couple things. When I say mint, I'm basically putting something onto the blockchain. I'm taking either I'm taking an asset, a picture that doesn't have an X on it. And I'm putting it on the blockchain so that it has an X on it, essentially. Um, I'm going to show you two different ways of minting. One of them is from a collector standpoint. Um, so I'll show, I'm going to go to a site and mint five pieces from a, a project and it'll show up in my wallet, hopefully. And then I'm going to mint a new piece of uh, work as a creator so you can see how that goes. Um, you'll also get to see OpenSea in this process. Uh, I'll make sure to point out when the wallet pops up, all that great stuff. Again, we could go really deep into all of this, but with the time that we have, I just wanted to make sure you guys see what it kind of looks like so that you can ask some questions towards the end here um, and maybe fill in some blanks for you. All right, I'm gonna jump over to this site. This site is for a project called Feces. My friend, Brock McBlockchain, and that's his name. He is an anonymous person, but uh, that's, that's his handle on the internet. This is a project of his. Um, let's see. It's essentially a fish tank project. So you buy fish, they show up in a tank. You can interact with them. Um, his fish are pretty crazy though. They do all kinds of wild, fun things. Um, so I've come to a site, uh, I can read all about his fishies. Um, I can see that these are, you know, they're NFTs. Um, and then he's not the best UX guy. I hope Brock isn't listening. Uh, Cause he put his, you know, his primary call to action way down here at the bottom. Um, so I'm confident this is a project I want to buy. I can see the price right here, 0.033 ETH plus gas. I can only buy 10 at a time. I've got a few already, so I'm just going to buy five and I'm going to mint a fish. So I hit mint a fish and you see this little pop up that came up, right? This thing with a fox in it. This is MetaMask. This is what the MetaMask wallet looks like on desktop. It is a Chrome extension. So it kind of follows you around. It's connected to a whole bunch of different sites if I allow it to be at any given time. Um, right now it's connected to his site. When I hit mint, it popped it up and it said, Hey, um, you're going to move money from your account to this address, which is his ETH address. Um, this is the site I'm connected to. I'm going to make a purchase. It's going to cost me this much Ethereum. I always double check how much was the mint price. They told me multiply that by the number. Is it the same number here? Plus gas fees. If it is great. Um, sometimes it's not, and you gotta, you, and that's typically a malicious project. You just want to make sure, cause I'm going to sign a contract when I click this button, I want to make sure that I understand what I'm paying for, how much I'm paying and that it's not different than what I expected. Um, so I can see that this is, this is the price. That's the price in dollars. And then down here, some details about the transaction. So there's a section labeled gas. 
and there's a fee associated and there's a total. So this gas fee, this is the cost of the transaction. I'm gonna use up 60 bucks worth of energy to buy these five things, is what this is saying. Like I said, sometimes this could be thousands of dollars. This is tacked on to my purchase price, okay? Um, it says it's likely gonna happen in 30 seconds. Why does it say likely? Because it could take longer. This could take an hour. It could never go through. If the gas price spikes and it's, and I sign off at 60 and it spikes up to 200 bucks for whatever reason, um, that transaction is going to stall until the gas price comes back down to 60 bucks. I can change that gas price. I could crank that up to $50,000, whatever I wanted. Um, it would charge me that, um, but I would be pretty certain it would go through quick because that gas fee is essentially the energy you're using, but you're essentially paying miners to solve a, a crypto problem <laughs> and they're bidding on that problem basically. And that's part of the fee as well. But again, you can go way too deep into it. All right, so everything looks good. I can reject this, which I'm gonna do really quick just to show you, or I can confirm it. If I reject it, window goes away, closes it out. The site tells me that I canceled it and then it disappeared. Um, but I am gonna mint these things. Um, it's always a safe bet to, if you're not in a hurry, just connect it, cancel it, come back and try it again. Look, I came back a few seconds later. Now gas fee is 48 bucks. Hell yeah, I just saved 12 bucks. So I'm gonna pay 500 bucks for these five fish. It's incredible. It's going right into my buddy's wallet. I'm gonna make sure I tell him about it later. Um, so it says my fish have been, been delivered. So I just signed a contract. They took my ETH, they're sending my, my fiche. Those will show up in my wallet in a minute and we'll take a look at that in a second. So now I just minted five new fish. There are now five new fish in the world. I'm really excited, I can't wait to name them. Um, so I just minted something from a collection. We'll go to my wallet really quick. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if they showed up yet. This is OpenSea, by the way. So OpenSea is a, it's a, a website. They do make an app for it as well. Um, the site is much, much better. Um, this is my profile page. On my profile page, you can see all kinds of stuff. Um, you can see what I've collected. Oh, look, there's my fish. Uh, you can see what I've collected. So in this wallet, I have 234 NFTs. Um, you could also see things I've created, things I've favorited, et cetera, things I've hid. Um, and there's my new fish. I just bought this guy. Look at, he's got a number. He's owned by me. He came from the fish's collection. I can click on that. I can see all the other 1,038 fish. And I could always find mine inside there. Anyway. So those I, have been I don't think we can see. Oh, there they are. Oh, there you is there, is there a lag? So I'm really excited about my new fish. Um, now I could sell these things. Like I could hit this button up here. I could sell it. Um, I could transfer it to somebody else. That's probably what I'll do. Like, I like these fish a lot. I'll probably give a few fish away to friends so that they have fish too. Um, that'd be great. So now I just minted something. It showed up on my wallet. It's mine now. I went through it really quick, but I bought five NFTs. Um, now I'm going to create a new NFT as a creator on OpenSea. There are a lot of ways to mint things, a lot. Um, a lot of different sites will let you do it. Um, I'm going to show you what is probably the most common for the run of the mill creator getting into the space today, and that's to use OpenSea. You can mint with your own contract. You can mint on other sites, like I said, but this is, this is probably the way a lot of you are going to do it your first time. Okay, I'm on my profile page. I'm inside a collection that I already have. I won't show you how to set up a collection and all that. There are great videos on the internet that will show you. But up here, I'm going to add an item. Okay. Uh, it's making me uh, sign my wallet again. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, you will have to sign your wallet a lot. But always make sure you, you look at what you're signing. Um, there are some malicious sites out there that will um, 
Well, it's real easy to, to sign the wrong thing if you aren't paying attention. Cool. So I'm going to create a new item uh, and a few things. I need an image. I need a name for the thing, um, a description, what collection it's going to be in, any properties I might assign to it. We won't go into any of this tonight. Um, I can mark it as explicit. Um, there's a lot of really interesting NFTs out there that aren't, you know, safe for people to see. Uh, so I could hide stuff like that. Um, supply is the quantity that I'm going to be minting. Um, and then the blockchain I'm going to mint on. Like I said earlier, OpenSea supports a few different blockchains. Uh, Ethereum and Polygon. There's going to be some other ones coming. That's some alpha information for you uh, very soon. Um, but I'm going to mint it on Ethereum. And let's show you how that all works. So over here on the side, I, I've already written my description. You know, you just kind of plunk this stuff in the way you think you would. Uh, I have my image back here somewhere. Here we go. It's called Heavy Dose. It's a pretty picture that I painted on an iPad. Um, I'm going to call this Heavy Dose Trip 4. Um, this particular NFT I'm going to gift to people that hold one of my other NFTs. And in doing so, I'm essentially creating more value for them, right? You bought this one piece of art. I've given them four other pieces of art because they own that one thing. I don't give this art to anyone else, just them. Uh, and they can keep it or they can sell it. A lot of folks have been selling the things that I give them for more money than the thing that they bought from me initially. So they're actually making money off of my art, which makes them want to buy more of my art. It's a scheme. Okay. Um, what else? I don't think I need anything else in here. Oh, uh, supply. So OpenSea by default on Ethereum will only mint you, let you mint one of something. Um, there's a hack for that. Let's see if I can, if it will let me... Uh, you basically have to type in something different in the URL. Uh, refreshes the page, and now I can mint an addition of something. Um, they don't put this one in the uh, the OpenSea uh, you know documentation anywhere. This is one that people just kind of figured out uh, how to do. So now I'm going to make instead of one of these, I'm actually going to make ten of them. Heavy dose trip four. Uh, put my description back in here if I still got it. Great. Cool. Okay. I got my image. I got my name. I got my description. I got make sure it's in the right collection. I'm not changing anything up here. Supply is not one. I'm going to make 10 of them. And I'm going to hit create. My wallet should pop up here in a second. And I'm essentially going to sign a contract that says, I would like to create these NFTs. Now, I said that I'm minting these things. And on OpenSea, when I create them like this, I'm technically not minting them yet. One of the things that OpenSea does that's a little different than other sites, it has something called oh, uh, lazy minting. That is to say, I've created this thing. I've put it on the OpenSea marketplace, but I'm not paying all the gas fees to mint it, right, mint it right this second. When somebody buys it, that will actually be the minting of it. So I've essentially, I've put the ball here and have put the mark on the ball, but it's not on the blockchain until somebody buys it. Um, because of that, I as a creator, I don't occur that fee of like, that that minting gas fee, which is super, super great. Um, so it's a, it's a cost savings for me. All right, so I've created a heavy dose trip four. Great. Here it is. Um, yeah, just like the fish I looked at, right? I can see which collection it belongs in up here. It's in my collection. I have 10 of them. I own all 10 because I haven't given them out yet. Um, and yeah, it exists. Now, I can edit this one because I haven't sold it or transferred it yet. 
Like I said, it's not officially minted at this very moment. As soon as it is, I can't edit shit anymore because it's on the blockchain. All that information is locked down. There are some exceptions to that rule. You'll probably hear some videos out there that like, we can go in and change the metadata um, and you can. Um, some, some contracts allow for that. Um, some developers can do it for you. Um, why would you want to do it? Let's say um, you, you have an NFT project that the image is supposed to change over time or if um, there's an error with an image that somebody finds or any number of reasons, projects do it all the time. They'll go in and refresh the metadata and the image will change. Um, there's some projects, really exciting projects right now where I own an NFT and the project team will give me like a skin for that NFT via metadata so I can go in and hit a switch and I could change the state of my NFT uh, without hitting the, you know, without transacting on the blockchain in any way. Um, it's pretty cool. So anyway, we've just done a couple things. We've, we minted from a collection, showed up in my wallet. We created a new item uh, on OpenSea. We kind of prepared it for minting. We lazy minted it so that, well, we prepared it for lazy minting so that when somebody buys this thing, they mint it, it will show up in their wallet. Um, and that's really like pretty high level on how to mint something in a couple different ways. Okay, we've talked about different types of what an NFT is, different types of NFTs, the basic how NFT you know, how an NFT lives in a wallet, how the blockchain writes all that, how you've interacted with a contract with your wallet. We've mentioned a couple of things. Um, a few things you can do to de-risk yourself in this space. Um, and you might ask yourself what the hell some of the stuff is. Um, we didn't go that deep into everything, but I just wanna make sure to kind of communicate these things so that you hear it once and hopefully you remember it um, later on as you, you go deeper into this stuff. Um, never share your wallet seed phrase. Um, I said at the beginning, if you share your wallet seed phrase, you're giving away the keys to your wallet and everything in it. You're fucked. It's no longer yours. Um, uh, maybe you'll get it back if somebody's really nice. Um, Nobody should ever ask you for it. If somebody asks you for it, hang up the phone, close your laptop, walk away, forget they existed. They don't need it. Um, I won't get into all the ways to keep your seed phrase safe. Just know you should take some extreme measures to do so. Um, in the NFT space, people will reach out to you, whether you're a collector or a creator. If people see that you're buying, selling, transacting in NFTs, your inbox will get hit hard with offers. People want to buy something. People want to sell you something. It's okay to ignore, ignore those people. You're not being rude. Nine times out of 10, it's not an actual person. It's a bot. Um, know what you were signing. So I interacted with a contract a couple times tonight. I did so really quickly. I didn't really read them thoroughly um, for the sake of demonstration here. Typically, I look it all over real hardcore. Um, people have lost millions of dollars because they clicked the wrong thing, thinking they were clicking the right thing. Um, it all looked on the up and up. It was not. So know what you're assigning. When you click a button that says, you know, on that contract, you're committing. The other thing is you are your own bank. Um, there are custodial wallets out there, things like Coinbase, um, that are they're kind of like a bank for you a little bit. Um, but by and large, um, you are your own bank. Um, if somebody takes your ETH or you lose it or you send it into the great unknown, there's nobody to call to get it back. There's, there's no police. Um, nobody's going to help you. Nobody's going to come to your aid. Um, find a pot of people you trust. This is the most, I think, the most important thing. Um, even if you don't know anything about NFTs, Find a group of three or four friends that also want to know about NFTs. Learn together. Do things together. Learn from each other's mistakes. Talk a lot. The, the whole... The, the last year, I've spent four to 12 hours a day 
on Clubhouse or Twitter spaces with my NFT friends, learning from one another every day, whether it's uh, there's an issue with OpenSea on that particular day, or we've found somebody's found an exploit on a contract, or so and so ripped off this other person, or there's this new platform you need to learn about, or if there's four or five of you, you'll learn four or five times faster. Um, just make a club, do it, make friends. Um, and if somebody starts acting like a, a dick, kick them out. You just don't have time for that shit. Um, paid promos or scams. Uh, if you're a creator, you're going to get people reaching out to you saying, I will help boost your project. I have 10 million followers on Instagram. I'll do a story for you for 10 grand. Let's do it. It's a scam. Don't give anybody money for promotion unless you know that organization that wants to promote you um, or you've dealt with them in some other way. Nine times out of 10, they're just there to take your money, man. You won't see any lift out of it. It's probably not the celebrity they say they are. Um, this is not a brag, but like every day there are like four to five verified Instagram or Twitter accounts in my DMs offering to connect me to some celebrity. Like, hey, you want to work with this person? Or hey, I'll get you in this network. All fucking scams. Uh, FOMO. Fear of missing out. This is so real. It sounds like a joke. Like, oh, I won't get that. When you see your friend walking around with a $25,000 JPEG, eh, it looks really cool, man. Um, you feel like you might've missed the boat because he, you know, he paid 500 bucks for it and now it's worth 50 grand or a hundred grand. Like you, you want to mint the next thing that person mints. You want to go mint projects like crazy because that could be the one that 10 X's. It could be the one that 50 X's and it, it won't probably won't be man. Um, I've bought NFTs um, that I didn't mint that had not yet revealed. So that is to say somebody minted it for 500 bucks. Um, it had not yet revealed on OpenSea what it looks like. You know, I've paid like an ETH and a half for some of these damn things. And then they all reveal and it goes to the fucking shitter. Like, and then it's worth 500 bucks again. Um, because I was, I didn't want to miss the boat. It was going to be the next big project. Um, I was a sucker. I say that because um, there's a term in the space called pump and dump. You will fall victim to this at least a thousand times. Um, um, it is a project is really well positioned. The marketing team did a great job. A lot of excitement around it. You maybe missed the mint. You get it on secondary at an inflated price. That was the plan all along. That project is, um, you know, the, the whales that either invested heavily in it or the folks that minted, you know, half of the damn collection, they're just going to sell it at that high price. Um, knowing there's not, there may not be a ton of value in the project. They're just going to feed off the, the hype that everybody's trying to get it, feeding off the FOMO. Um, so they dump it on the community basically. Um, and then when that price goes to zero or, or starts to drop, um, much like me a couple times, you're left, you know, you put a, ETH and a half in, and now you got something that's worth half an ETH. Well, you just made somebody an ETH richer. Um, that's one way to think about it. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen a lot. Um, don't click on shit. So somebody sends you a link in a DM, don't click on it. It's just don't. Um, even if it says, you know, google.com or it says a URL you think you know and love, just it's not worth it, man. Um, especially on a device that you have a wallet on. Um, I don't have a, a mobile wallet on my phone because uh, I like to click on shit. Um, all my transactions I do only on a desktop. I have a dedicated PC for it, typically. Tonight's a, a, <laughs> a little different. Um, I have a machine that's dedicated just for doing uh, blockchain stuff. It doesn't do anything else. Um, and I don't click on anything there. So if the wallet's on your device, be really mindful of what you're clicking on. Um, not that the click will do anything malicious per se, but it might open up a contract window. And when you're on OpenSea the next time and you go to you know buy something, it pops up. You might be clicking, a, you might be signing a contract that you didn't realize you had open because you clicked on something. Or yeah, there's just a million different ways this could happen. Um, wallets, hot, hard, 
and cold wallets. There's also custodial wallets. There are a bunch of different wallet types. All of them have different purposes. Um, I won't go into wallet strategy here, but you do need to have a wallet strategy. Um, a quick example, just to use the, the metaphor we used earlier, my asset going into my hot wallet, my MetaMask, your MetaMask wallet is a hot wallet. So I put it in my MetaMask wallet. Your MetaMask wallet, like I said, is a Chrome extension. It's kind of like walking around with money in your wallet on the street. It's, it's the easiest thing for somebody to pull something out of. It's the easiest thing because you're transacting. You're pulling it out a lot. Every time you go to the store, you're pulling it out. You're buying something. You're signing a contract. You're interacting. You're using your hot wallet to do a lot of those interactions. So therefore, it's the most susceptible to being infiltrated. Um, what, I, what some people like to do is they'll have a cold wallet or a hot wallet or both. So I, I would buy something with my MetaMask wallet. And then as soon as I got home, I take it out of my MetaMask wallet and I put it in my cold wallet over here. And then I might even move it from here into a hard wallet. So I, I have multiple wallets that I move my assets through. Each time I move it through those assets, I, I move it further and further away from the watchful eyes and, and contracts that might be trying to get into this guy and take my stuff. So have a wallet strategy. Uh, there are a lot of videos out there about that. Take a look at them. It's important. Um, I know quite a few folks that have lost millions of dollars um, the, the, the easy way. <laughs> Don't click on Discord links. Um, and uh, pardon my French here, but really fuck Discord. It is the worst place. Um, it is the place for NFTs in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of projects have, you know, really robust Discord communities. It's a great place to learn about things. It's also a really great place to get ripped off or misled. Um, if you do play on Discord for NFT reasons, turn off friend requests, turn off messages, um, and just have fun. Just be careful. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there you can catch. Uh, and of course, newbies are prey. Whatever you do, my God, don't go into a clubhouse or Twitter spaces and say, I'm new to NFTs because anybody in that room that's not new to NFTs, they'll appreciate your situation. But those folks that are kind of have ill intent, um, they may not come after you right now. They may not come after you later, but you just make yourself a victim. It's like walking into a bar and saying, I got, you know, $5,000 in my back pocket and I'm here to get drunk. Like you're not walking out of that bar with $5,000. Um, so it's okay to listen. It's okay to go into these spaces and ask questions, but just don't identify yourself as somebody that doesn't know what the hell you're doing um, until you get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of confidence and, and can ask things in a way that, um, yeah, doesn't make you a target. There's so many other things you could do to de-risk, but these are some just good high level ones. I'm sure as we, if we open up for questions, people have a lot of other great op, uh, um, suggestions as well. Okay, where are we at? Okay, right on time. A few helpful links. Um, I just told you don't click on shit. And I'll, I'll give this list to Christian. I don't know if he has a way to distribute to everybody. Um, these are links that you can trust. Um, but again, um, maybe type them in. I don't know. Just be careful, okay? Uh, I was even hesitant to supply links because I believe in don't click on shit so much. Um, I mean, the difference between a .io and a .com uh, can make a, a big financial difference in, in, <laughs> in, in what happens to you. So for ETH, um, there are, like I said, there are a lot of different wallets. MetaMask.io is where to go and get it. Um, they have a mobile app. Um, uh, the Chrome extension is really the, the thing that most people use. There are a few different markets listed here. Like I said, OpenSea is the biggest uh, because it is the aggregator. Um, a few other uh, ETH-based marketplaces for really art NFTs, I would say. Um, again, just given my background, where I'm coming from, this is where I spend my time. Um, looks rare is actually, actually looks rare is another kind of marketplace. Um, that's 
it aggregates much like OpenSea, but a different kind of set of rules and fees. Um, Super Rare is a highly curated uh, NFT marketplace. Only the best of the best um, artists are accepted on there. Uh, the work there goes for premium, um, though the prices seem to be slipping there a little bit. Uh, Nifty Gateway is another interesting one. Um, it too is a curated marketplace. Um, unlike some of the others, it accepts credit cards. So if you don't have any ETH at the moment, you can buy some stuff on your card and explain that to your significant other at a later time. Uh, Known Origin is another great marketplace, also curated, though less so than some of the others. Um, great quality art. Um, the reason curated is always a little more fun, I think, is you don't have to wade through so much uh, stuff like you do on OpenSea. And OpenSea, like I said, is there's a lot of copy minting, a lot of uh, lookalike collections. So it's easy to, if you don't know really what you're looking for, um, it's easy to buy the wrong thing. Um, on some of the more curated platforms, much less risk of that. Um, they vet their artists, they interact with their artists. It's hard to get on these platforms for a reason. Um, another link that's really important is Etherscan. Um, there's a lot of information on Etherscan, but it essentially allows you to view any transaction that's happened, um, I, th I think, since forever on Ethereum. So like, you can go on Etherscan and pull up my wallet address and see exactly how much ETH is in it. You can see what transactions I've had, um, when I had them, who I had them with, how much they were for. It's, it's really the, the thing that brings a lot of transparency to the blockchain. An ETH blockchain perspective. For Tezos, a couple great wallets, Kukai and Temple, uh, Marcus, Hikuknunk, and uh, Object, uh, both great places. Um, neither of those are curated in any way, um, though there is a lot less copy minting and a lot less uh, kind of what I would say risky or fraudulent behavior. Um, they're not exempt for sure. But uh, they tend to be smaller artist communities, a um, little more authentic in that way. And then a great place to view transactions there is uh, Tezkit. Great. I have said so much, um, and I went through so much really quickly. And I'm sure a lot of folks that are familiar with NFTs are like, well, he got this wrong, and he should have said that differently, and he skipped over this. Um, there's just so much to try to communicate in, in an hour. I hope you leave with more questions than you came with. You know, it's really my intent here. Um, oh, I forgot one of the more favorite things. Uh, there's a link here for NFT terminology. Um, I was going to try to create a list of all the slang that has, you know, popped up in this subculture. Um, but it, it was a fruitless effort because this is not a bad one. Um, much like any other subculture that kind of pops up, um, it has its own vernacular and terms that they boggled me for the first few months. I didn't know what the hell anybody was saying. I really didn't. Um, this, this link will give you some good um, insight into some of the slang, but also some of the acronyms um, and all that great stuff. Yeah, talking about minting, hen, man, I missed hen. Cool. So Christian, I've kind of reached the end of my presentation rope here. Um, the only thing left is um, if you want to follow me, these are some good things. Um, I know Christian mentioned my website and my Instagram at the top of this. Um, I don't even know what a website is anymore. I haven't touched that thing in a long time. And um, Instagram is kind of a, I wouldn't say it's a dying platform for uh, NFTs. It just really, nothing's really happening there for NFTs. I post art there because it's, uh, I get a, you know, a lot of followers there, but nobody buys anything there. It's not a good place to market NFTs. Um, Twitter's definitely the place to, to be um, when it comes to marketing and seeing what's going on and following people that are really active in the space. Um, so that's the place to, to catch up with me. Um, I do have a Discord. Um, uh, don't use Discord, but if you do, make sure you join mine, Brian Morris. What the fuck? Um, 
where you'll be inundated with a lot of uh, me trying to shill you art. Cool. Anyway, Christian, you want to open awesome. up for questions? Yeah, thanks so much. That was a wonderful presentation. I definitely feel like I learned so much now. Um, there are some questions in the chat here um, that I will be reading out. And then if anyone has any additional questions, you're more than welcome to drop them in the chat or you could also un unmute yourself and ask. But let's see. So one of the questions that was received during your presentation, um, so someone said, what's the difference between ETH, Ether, and Ethereum? Are they all the same thing? Yep. Okay. Got it. Different shorthand. Mm -hmm. And then someone else asked, are there any resources for artists if their assets are copied? Um, there are a few courses of action that you can take, um, but no real resources. Um, on OpenSea, well, hmm. yeah, there's a few actions you could take. On OpenSea, you can report a collection. Um, on Crypto.com, you can report a collection. On a lot of the open marketplaces, you can re you can do reporting. And so, if you go to an asset and you see that it's clearly not the original creator, um, you click a button, and it informs the OpenSea team. You can imagine how many times um, something is reported before anybody takes any action on it. It's pretty much like, you know, talking to a brick wall. Um, you can write a help ticket essentially to OpenSea. Um, and if you know the right people inside the organization, um, you know, you can talk to those people directly, but there really is no phone number or anything that you can call. It's, uh, it's all done through clicking on a little button. Um, not publicly shared, but if you send an email to copyright at OpenSea.io with a link to the thing that's been copied and a link to the original um, and kind of state your case, you will get a much faster action out of that. So that's that's a good tip right there. Um, things like Hikiknunk or other platforms, I'm not as familiar with how you report there. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, someone asks, since gas prices are always changing, is there a good time to buy? Yes, um, there are definitely um, seasons and cycles to gas prices, though not always predictable. It's kind of like the weather. Um, you think it's going to be sunny, but not right now, buddy. Uh, it's going to rain. Um, typically, off hours are better. Um, like Sunday at 2 a.m., typically okay gas prices. Um, there are a few different websites uh, that will give you the current gas prices. So you can kind of watch that and monitor it. Some of them have visualizations of gas price trends, etc. cetera. Um, I don't have those links handy, but I could probably hook Christian up and we can share them at a later time. Um, but yeah, you can... You can monitor gas prices uh, a couple different ways. And you just kind of got to, and it could change very dramatically. Like a storm could come in pretty quick. Um, it can go from, you know, a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand bucks in the blink of an eye, depending on what projects are minting, how much volume is going on. Um, there's this thing called gas wars, where a project that is highly sought after, um, people will increase the amount of ETH they're putting towards the gas transaction fees in order to beat others out. Um, and people will go really insane. Like they'll spend thousands of dollars when everybody else is just paying, you know, a hundred bucks because they really want to get that thing. If mm -hmm. there's 10,000 of something and a million people are going after it, those that pay the most will win. Hey, Brian. So I just asked that question. So it seems like you really need to do your research on gas before actually getting into like NFTs. Would you say that's somewhat correct? I wouldn't say you have to do your research on gas. You just have to understand that it's a fee. If you're dealing on ETH, it's a fee that you really need to consider and be mindful of. Um, I didn't the first time I minted something, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, man. I was, I was like, fuck it, let's go. Um, 
And I think I paid like 200 bucks to mint my first piece, which I didn't, I don't think sold for that much. Um, I didn't know any better. I was minting on a site called foundation that had really high fees. Um, and I just thought this is what we're supposed to do. I didn't know that if I'd waited, you know, 12 hours, I would have paid a third of that. So if you know that guys, price, gas prices change and you're not in a big rush, wait it out. Like you can open up that MetaMask extension. Let's say you want to buy something. You can click, you want to buy it. That thing will pop up. You'll see the gas price is like 60 bucks. Like we, what we saw. You can just leave it open. That gas price will update every, what, 10 seconds or so, I think, with the current gas price. So you can sit there for five, 10 minutes and watch it go up and down. Like when I closed it and came back, it was, what, 45 instead of 60? So in a matter of a minute, it went down 15 bucks. Um, so does that, if you do pay uh, a high price for gas, does that make your NFT mm, up? No? Okay. This makes you more of a... I didn't want yeah, to say figured. It, 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 <laughs> yeah. You're you will pay for your eagerness sometimes. Good question. Um, so someone asks, uh Tim asks, as a creator, have you considered selling physical prints with NFTs or is a community more digital only? Um, they are two different audiences we have found. Um where do I start with this? You can offer collectors prints of your work. And I've done that in the past and it's great. And a few people take you up on it. Um, by and large, somebody that's buying an NFT, um, they're le really less interested in the physical because that, unless they really love the work, because that physical object doesn't maintain, like they can't sell it, they can't flip it. Um, and a lot of folks are buying these things as, a storage of value or a way to, you know, increase their ETH, you know, they'll buy it at one price, sell it for more. It's part of the game, part of the appeal. Um, prints don't have that, obviously. Another thing is a lot of folks in the Web3 space, they do want to remain anonymous, right? Your identity is your wallet address and that's it. Um, you start giving out your home address for shipping stuff too. And uh, well, you've just doxed yourself. Um, and, uh, for the common man, that's not a big deal, but you know, man, some of these folks, you'd be surprised. Um, somebody that might have 300 followers on Twitter is 25 years old and has a, a, you know, a pixelated meme for a PFP that dude might have 75 million bucks. Like, and somebody that's walking around like I got everything in the world with a bunch of apes, they may not have a pot to piss in. So like, you really don't know who you're dealing with and, and folks do like to remain anonymous. And as such, a lot of folks don't want the physical work. Sorry, I went down a rabbit hole there, but wanted to explain that. And also there are two different audiences, like people that were buying my artwork in the real world. I don't know, maybe two of them own one of my NFTs. Mm -hmm. It's just two different. I just had to start from scratch and building an audience in the NFT space. Nobody knew who the hell I was because it's a bunch of crypto bros, you know, at least a year ago. That's pretty much who it was. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes sense. And then, and then someone else has a, Michael has a question and he says, as a creator for your first piece, is it best to create one or should you jump right into a whole collection? Ooh. I don't know. That's up to you, man. Um, there is no right or wrong answer in that approach. Um, if you want to, market yourself as I guess it comes down to how you want to position yourself. If you put one piece out there and it's your first, you just put one piece out there um, and you haven't shown folks that you do other work in that same style, mm -hmm. um, it might be difficult for somebody to pay the money for that piece. That is to say, well, he's made this one, but they've made this one, but will they make another? Like, are they going to go away and disappear? Um, are they credible person? Mm -hmm. You know, is there, is this really their style or are they just messing around? People don't want to buy something that, you know, like you just scribbled it and next week you're going to go paint something. And the next week you're going to make a sculpture, like consistency, really much like in the art world, consistency pays here. So 
dropping one is okay. It's great, low risk, but people may not may not see your other body of work and therefore be less likely to buy this one thing because um, who knows if you'll go away. Um, but if you drop a collection, you're showing like, look, I have all this work in the same style. This is kind of what you can expect from me. Um, and so it builds a little more confidence in that. From a collector standpoint, it builds a little more confidence in that creator. Um, but yeah, either you, you can go about a bunch of different ways. Yeah, because I've noticed that um like you're very active and I'm sure that you're at, you're just the, how active you are plays into the value of your NFTs because they know that you're serious about it. And it's not just like this yeah. thing that you're doing just for fun. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, and I hope he doesn't mind me using his name. Um, have you guys heard of the designer hydro 74, like pretty popular designer does a lot of stuff for toys and games and all kinds of crazy stuff. He got in NFTs. He's actually one of the folks that got me into it. He minted some stuff. It did okay. He disappeared for like a year. And now he's trying to come back into the space. And everybody's like, well, what the, f like, you were gone a year. Mm -hmm. Like, all the stuff I bought isn't worth nearly as much as it was. I, it's not sure if you're going to be consistent in the space. Um, yeah, consistency in the space and showing that you're active as a creator that's equity, man. Um, one of the big ethos of, of Web3 in general, but especially NFTs, is this idea of community. Um, it's, the word is used a lot and overused, and it means many different things. But if you're not, if you're not visible and relevant, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to get some traction. So yeah, be active and show that you care. And then I, I have one question for you. Um, how do you go about, so when you were minting that um, the NFT, I didn't see you or maybe I missed it, but did you assign a value? Like what is that NFT? Like if someone wants to oh. buy it, what do they? I did not. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna drop that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna airdrop that to some collectors, oh, which it. I'm just gonna transfer it to them and I'm gonna pay the transaction fee. So I'm actually, I'm gonna pay to give it to them. Um, but for another piece, um, you would uh, you would list it. You'd hit this little button that hit sell, mm -hmm. and then you'd give it a price and duration. Um, there's other options there too. Like you can private list something. Mm -hmm. Like yesterday, I, had, I I made a piece, a commission piece for somebody, um, and in order for that piece to have a, they already they paid for half of it, so for them to pay the other half now that the work was done, I listed it privately so only they could buy it uh for the remainder of the price um and i set a time interval on there so if they didn't if they don't buy it within a week this is my rule this doesn't apply to anybody else but like if you commission a piece of work for me and i finish it and you don't buy it within a week i'm selling it to somebody else because mm -hmm. um, the price of east changes so much that you know i could be losing thousands of dollars because you're too busy to buy it or don't feel like buying it this week or whatever um, so you can set durations specific people um, all that great stuff. Got it. Um, and then someone uh, has a question. Ed, he says, "Can you start? Can you start by dropping a collection of twelve pieces and let people know you will have a hundred different pieces in the final collection once finished?" Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, promises or roadmaps, if you will, are very big in the NFT space, and people look for them. Um, just like in corporate America, right? Like what's the end goal look like and how are you getting there? That's kind of your roadmap. So it does breed confidence. Um, uh, as long as you deliver on it, um, I'll, I'll, I think some folks don't necessarily always understand what it's going to take to deliver on their roadmap. They'll make some big promises. So just make sure you, you put that message out there, make sure you can deliver it um, with confidence. Okay. And I know we have about seven minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through some of these other questions. Um, Henry asks, what are the limits of NFTs as far as what is able to be created into or converted to NFTs? Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that because uh, everything, every day is something new comes along. Um, I, th I think so long as in theory, if it's a digital asset, 
Um, I think as long as it's a digital asset, your biggest confines are going to be file storage, um, uh, depending on how you're minting it and where you're storing the assets that that contract points to. Um, like you couldn't mint a feature film. I mean, I guess you could, as long as you had the storage space to do it, but like, that's, that'd be really weird. Like that'd be really huge. That'd be a, a difficult, um, yeah, it'd be a big file to do. Uh, on OpenSea, I, don't quote me on this. I think the file limits 50 megabytes on OpenSea. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other platforms is a little larger. Some of the other platforms is a lot smaller. Got it. So I hope that answered your question. And then another a question that I have for you is, so do you, and it, it seems like just NFTs are becoming more and more popular. Do you, do you see NFTs as just being un unavoidable in the future? Do you see it? Do you see them just becoming something that becomes just part of our everyday life or? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Your, I mean, everything, your medical records, your, the deed to your house, your driver's license, your ticket for a Jay-Z concert. Um, all of it, all, it will all be, whether we call them NFTs or not, um, the, if, if there's, if it holds value or needs ownership needs to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for claimed. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the potential of it to be an NFT is, is pretty high. And I think every, I mean, every single industry is racing there. Um, to the degree that their their user base will accept it, mm -hmm. that's going to be, I think, the thing that slows it down is just the the acceptance of the technology. And then, and then, given that you've been, you said you minted your first NFT a week ago. It was a, a year, a week ago, right? Yep. Um, how to like? How does this might be a very specific question, but like, how does doing your taxes look, or like? How do you deal with <laughs> with those transactions and how do you report them? Um, it's going to be tough this year, especially in my wife and I's case. She she has a small business. I left my job. A bunch of crypto transactions across different chains. It's going to be a mess. Um, there are a few different sites that can help you. One is called Coinly. Mm -hmm. Another is a uh, acquainting is another one. Um, what these sites will do, they're kind of like QuickBooks a little bit mm -hmm. for your transactions. You give it your wallet address. And it essentially looks at all the data off of, you know, similar to Etherscan. And it, it tries to bucket things into things you've bought, things you've sold, transaction fees. Um, and it, it spits out a report that you can hand your accountant who will be bewildered. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but it, uh, it gives you some insight into it. Um, uh, be forewarned, uh, if you try a few of these different sites and I recommend that you do, um, you're going to get different numbers on each one. Um, so just kind of go with the grace of God and know that you do, you did diligence and the government's going to be about five to 10 years behind you. Um, so just be good in faith. Got it. And then I guess, given that we are, you know, an organization like devoted to graphic design, are there any, like what sort of, this, this might be a loaded question, but hmm. like what's, what words of advice would you give like graphic designers that are like looking to explore, like just get into the NFT space? Are there any, have you ever seen like any interesting use cases of just graphic designers finding use of the nft space um uh yes so um, let me find the words for this uh i guess it kind of depends on your role or, mm -hmm. or how you approach design but something that's very popular for a lot of freelance designers um, particularly those that do like t-shirt design or poster design um, they now consider the nft uh, on the other side of that job. So like I have a friend, she's an amazing illustrator. She was the artist at residence for the Grateful Dead for a long time. 
She has done a ton of artwork. Um, she's taken the Grateful Dead masthead off of these posters and minting them and making a lot of fucking money. And it's awesome because she owns the work. Like they bought the thing for the poster run, but she still retained the rights to the work. So she can use that. Um, so if you can find ways to utilize work you've already done to enter the space, that's a good jump start of like, what do I make? How do I do it? Like if you can utilize some of the things you've done from design gigs that aren't going to get you in a hell of a lot of trouble, that's one thing to consider. Um, but in terms of like other, other than applying your craft in a new way, in a new place, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of, the designers that I talk to that work in agencies, they're now, you know, part of the creative briefs are now NFTs. Um, and it's kind of, it's some of the stories I've heard are kind of scary where teams have sold NFT concepts to clients but don't know anything about Web3 or NFTs yet. Um, so whether you want to get into NFTs or not as a hobby or um, what have you, like I think as a designer, it will, it will come across your your desk in a brief at some point in the very near future. So be ready for it. Got it. Awesome. So I know we're at time and I want to be mindful of your time, Brian, and everyone else's time. I feel like we could talk all night about, about this stuff. Um, but I guess with that said, just I want to say thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and giving a such a thoughtful presentation. I know for me personally, I I like I've, I've been aware of NF NFTs and you and I have had conversations one-on-one -on -one about them. Um, but I think in particular tonight, um, I just took so much away from this. So thank you so much. And thanks to everyone else for your questions. Um, this talk is being recorded, so it will be on our YouTube page. So if anyone ever feels like, if you didn't get a chance to take notes or screenshots, um, we'll send a link to everyone that registered in your email. And, and and that link will include a recording of this. But I guess with that said, do you have any parting words, Brian? Anything to say before we drop off? Uh, no, this was great. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, if anybody has any questions, hit me up. You know, Hit me up on Twitter. It's probably the best place um, that I'll see it. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity. And I hope I, I both excited you and scared the shit out of you. <laughs> um, it's a really fun... It's a really fun space. Um, just you know, be mindful of what you're doing, and uh, you'll do fine. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thank you, Brian, so much, and we'll talk soon. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Bye. Thank Bye. you.